Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ZOA Book Club. Um, we're here to celebrate and congratulate Alan Dershowitz on his 50th book, uh, The Price of Principle. I'm going to try to hold it up. Um, and uh, two of the things that I had specifically wanted Alan to address when he speaks to us um, are one, his uh, writing, uh, his writing uh, process and editing process and so on. I think that as uh, from somebody so prolific as Alan uh, and as a book club that loves writing and books, I think we'd really all love to hear about that. Uh, Alan spoke a little bit about that at the beginning of his book. And I think that would be really fascinating for all of us. Uh, another item that uh, I had asked Alan if he could address is the, um, the Mishaya case at the USC. Um, this was a case of uh, a woman on, uh, who was a DEI, a diversity inclusion and uh, a diversity equity and inclusion senator at the um, uh, at, at USC at the at the Senate for USC and made all sorts of threats um, to kill uh, blanking Zionists. Um, ZOA was involved in that. We had uh, written letters demanding st much stronger action from the uh, from from the board of trustees and the president of the university. I think Susan Tuckman from ZOA, who is the uh, director of ZOA Center for Law and Justice, as well as Jonathan Ginsburg. Um, yeah, I think Susan Tuckman is on, is on right now. She was involved in that, as, as was Morton Klein and Jonathan Ginsburg, the head of ZOA campus. And Alan spoke about that in the book. So I was hoping that he could, um, that's, that that's one of the things that he could address during his talk, in addition to anything else that he'd like to speak about. And uh, we're very pleased to have you, Alan. And uh, without further ado, uh, by the way, there was, there was a problem with uh, getting the screen. So as Alan may just be speaking uh, <laughs> without, without us seeing him on the screen. Alan? Well, I never... I never made it for my looks anyway. So if oh. it's just me talking, that's fine with me. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. ZOA is one of my favorite organizations. I've been uh, a supporter of ZOA through its various incarnations. Uh, I've written a lot about Brandeis. I collect Brandeis uh, material. I own a copy of the original, uh, um, the Jewish state uh, in German. Uh, and many original uh, Zionist um, uh, um, uh, memorabilia. So I'm a great collector of Zionist memorabilia. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of the ZOA. I'm a strong supporter and friend of Mort. And so it's my honor to speak uh, today to this uh, uh, great collection of American Zionists. Um, uh, first about my writing process. I've been writing all my life. Uh, I write every day. Um, I'm just about sending my 51st book into the publisher, and I'm already halfway through my 52nd book, and uh, I have ideas for my 53rd. I'm 84 years old, so um, my goal is to live to 120, I'll get 100 books, but uh, I'll settle for 60. Uh, I love writing. Um, I love writing alone. I don't use research assistants, um, and um, I don't uh, butcher over my writing. Um, uh, uh, my belief is that everything that anybody writes is always a first draft. Um, there's always room and time for revision. So I don't obsess over whether I have every single um, word right and um, every single idea completed. I, I turn it out, let people criticize it, and then I um, write my next book. So uh, that's what I've done. I've done it for, for all these uh, years. Um, of course, now my books are not available in the Chilmark Library. Uh, the Chilmark Library, um, the, the, uh, the home of uh, a so-called liberalism, has banned my books that uh, I've written since the time I defended President Trump on the floor of the Senate. They haven't included a single one of my books. I used to be the most popular speaker uh, at the library, and then they canceled me saying I was too popular. They couldn't handle the crowds. And when I said, uh, well, why don't you just limit the audience to 100 or whatever? Oh, we didn't think about that. So I've been canceled by the library. My books have been banned. Temple Emanuel in New York. Temple Emanuel in New York has banned me. I wanted to speak about defending Israel 
Instead, they had Peter Beinhart, who calls for the end of Israel as a Jewish state. This is Temple Emmanuel, the largest, most influential reform synagogue. Um, I have been banned by the 92nd Street Y, where I try to um, have a talk about my book, Defending Israel. Uh, they banned me, refused to allow me to speak. I've been banned by the Ramaz School. Um, uh, they asked me to come and alert their students to how to deal with anti-Semitism in college, particularly the juniors and the, sen and the seniors. I probably have more experience in speaking on American college campuses than anybody other than Mort Klein. And then I got a call from the headmaster saying the mach is on the board of directors, uh, don't want anything to do with you. And so uh, you've been banned. And that's when I decided to write my book, The Price of, of Principle. I haven't changed one bit in the 60 years I've been uh, a lawyer and in public life. Uh, my views have always been the same. I defended communists. I defended Nazis. I've defended anti-Zionists. I've defended Zionists. My job as a lawyer is to defend the rights of people I agree with and disagree with. And er, people were fine with that as long as it wasn't Donald Trump. But as soon as it became uh, Donald Trump, uh, I, I no longer had a seat at the table. I was now uh, banned. People were disappointed in me. Uh, my God, I used to defend civil liberties. What am I doing defending Donald Trump? Uh, and I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. I'm a supporter of the Abraham Accords. I'm a supporter of his recognition of Jerusalem. I'm a supporter of his recognition of the Golan Heights. I helped, in fact, formulate uh, the theory behind uh, the Golan Heights, uh, explaining to President Trump that uh, no army has ever returned a battleship in the middle of a war. And that's what the Golan Heights is. It's a battleship. It's a place from where weapons were fired at innocent uh, Jewish and Israeli civilians uh, living in the valley below. And he understood that. And so I'm very proud of what I accomplished within the Trump administration, even though I voted against Trump. Um, I have advised every single president since Jimmy Carter on, uh, they didn't give him, he didn't listen to my advice, Jimmy <laughs> Carter, but others did. Um, and um, I've advised every president uh, and consulted with every president on the issue of uh, Israel. In fact, in my book, Defending Israel, I tell the stories of my encounters with every American president, every American prime minister. And so until I defended President Trump, um, I was the, one of the most sought after speakers And 90 seconds. Why? I was the second most sought after speaker after Elie Wiesel. And now audiences all over the country can't hear my defense of Israel anymore because the 92nd Street Y has decided to uh, cancel me. And so I decided to write this book, Price of Principle, telling these stories, naming names, pointing fingers, um, defending myself from the false charges that have been made uh, against me. And one of the organizations, of course, that never canceled me was the ZOA. I've spoken uh, in many uh, sessions. I'm going to be there again uh, not long from now. And um, uh, I've been very welcomed by the ZOA, but not by as I said before, Temple Emanuel, the 92nd Street Rai, Ramaz, and other schools. Next week, I'm going to Harvard uh, to speak at the Chabad at Harvard, which I helped to found 25 years ago. And we're all interested in seeing whether there'll be protests against the professor who taught there for 50 years because I, I defended uh, the constitutional rights of, of President Trump. I have a thick skin. Uh, I've defended a lot of unpopular people and I've gotten a lot of criticism for it, but never like this. And now it's been taken out on my wife, uh, my children, my grandchildren. My wife was working out in the gym. A woman walked in and said, oh, that's Alan Dershowitz's wife. I can't be in the same room with her. Um, I was invited to a dinner party and seated next to Caroline Kennedy, who I've known for years. I've had dinner at her house. She's been at our house. Um, and she told me, that if she knew I had been invited, she wouldn't have come. This is the ambassador to Australia who's supposed to negotiate with the leaders of China and North Korea, and she can't be in the same room with somebody who probably would have earned the place and profiles and courage at her father's been alive and writing books about people who stood up for principle. But she can't be with somebody who defended the rights of President Trump. And I'm gonna to continue to defend his rights. Uh, no matter how much unpopularity it causes me. I mean, the price that my family has paid is too high. 
Um, but it's in my nature to fight back. I've always fought back. Uh, when I was in college and I defended the right of communist teachers to teach mathematics and to teach um, French literature, the president of Brooklyn College, Harry Gideon, he's refused to write me a recommendation to a law school, even though I was top of my class at Brooklyn College. Uh, uh, when I defended the right of Nazis to march through Skokie, more I opposed the power of a city to ban speeches by Nazis. Even my mother was upset with me. Uh, and understandably, uh, my mother said to me, whose side are you on, the Jews or the Nazis? I said, I'm on the Jew side, and the Jews have thrived under the First Amendment for years, and I want them to continue to thrive because, you know, first they'll stop the Nazis and then they'll come for the Zionists. And that's, of course, what's happened on college campuses today. The Zionists uh, do not have the ability to speak as anti Zionists do, and uh, schools uh, apply an absolute double standard. Uh, anything goes when intersectionality people. Uh, say nasty thing about Jews, about Zionists, about Israel. There's no limitation on that. But if you uh, say the same thing about a favorite group, uh, nothing happens uh, to you. And the school says freedom of speech, freedom of speech. Now, I'm a big supporter of freedom of speech, but I'm also a supporter of what I call the circle of civility. That is, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The shoe has to fit on the other foot. And so whatever rules there are in any universities, public or private, uh, have to apply equally to uh, pro-Zionist speech and anti-Zionist speech. That isn't true of a shul. I mean, Temple Emanuel could easily justify inviting me, but not Peter Beinhardt, who doesn't believe that Israel has the right to exist as the state of the Jewish people. They have the right to do that, and we have the right to criticize them for doing it, which I do in my book, The Price of Principle. So... I'm going to continue to live a life of principle. I'm too old to change. I just turned 84. Uh, and uh, I've been making the same arguments since I've been in, in high school. Uh, and um, people have said, oh, look, Dershowitz has changed. He's become more conservative. I haven't changed one bit. The world around me has changed. The pendulum has swung. We're living now in a time worse, worse than McCarthyism. Why do I say worse than McCarthyism? because McCarthyism was brought about by a relatively small number of older people who represented the past. Whereas the current McCarthyism on college campuses is done by professors, administrators, and students who are our future. And so the future is in danger with the new McCarthyism. People say, well, you lived through the Vietnam War and the protest there, uh, isn't this the same? No, it's not. The protests during the Vietnam War were brought about by a relatively small number of extreme radicals. It wasn't bought into by universities, by corporations, by the media. Today, the left-wing McCarthyism is practiced on campuses, is taught by teachers. Today, for the first time in my life, teachers at major American universities, including Harvard, including Yale, are saying, why do we need the Constitution? Why do we need the First Amendment? We know it's true. We know who's guilty and innocent. Why do we need due process? These are just barriers to our way of getting what we want. And that's why it's more dangerous, more dangerous. People have criticized me for this. It's more dangerous than McCarthyism, more dangerous than the Vietnam period. We're in a, a time of terrible risks to our constitution. Our founding fathers, Madison and Hamilton and Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin in Washington, they'd be turning over in their graves if they knew how free speech was being restricted. It's worse than the Alien and Sedition Acts, again, because the Alien and Sedition Acts only apply to a relatively small number of people. But the, this kind of uh, censorship and double standard uh, applies broadly across corporations, in the media. Um, the New York Times today, uh, has become a propaganda organ of the left. When it reports on Israel, its editorials appear on the front page. That is, there's no difference between its opinion and its reporting. It reports in such an incredibly biased way. And people take it as the truth. It's the newspaper and nothing could be further from uh, the truth. I mean, there are a few newspapers that 
maintain the distinction between news and editorial. The Wall Street Journal is one of them, and I'm proud to write for them from uh, time to time. But in terms of cancellation, I wrote more op-eds for the New York Times than any law professor in the history of America. Um, and now I'm banned from the New York Times. I can't write uh, op-eds um, for two reasons. One, my alleged support for Donald Trump, who I voted against, but whose rights I defended, but my strong support for Israel. People call me an extremist on Israel. And of course, people on the other side, many from the Zionist Organization of America, criticize me because I'm too supportive of the two-state solution. I call myself pro-Israel, pro-Palestine. I've met with uh, Mohammed Abbas and with Arafat not and heard, tried heard. my best to try to bring about a peaceful resolution. Mort and I fight about that all the time. But the difference is that Mort and the Zionist Organization of America treats me with, with respect. We have intellectual debates. Uh, I'm on the phone with Mort. Uh, arguing about uh, uh, the, what's going on in the Middle East, whether there's a prospect for a two-state solution. And, and, and we end the phone call in a very friendly way. On the other side, you can't have a debate. You cannot have a debate. And um, uh, because they know what's right, because their short truth is on their, on their side, dissent is not important. Due process is not important. Um, People who are accused, I wrote another book called Guilt by Accusation about the false charges against me growing out of my representation of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and uh, the left, which generally used to support due process, used to support uh, being tough on prosecutors, used to support opposition to laws like the Espionage Act of 1917, They've suddenly changed. In fact, the new book that I'm working on after the current one is called Get Trump. Get Trump. How the effort to try to prevent Trump from running in 2020 has endangered civil liberties, human rights, um, and, and particularly free speech. So my life is devoted to living by the principles I've lived by. In my book, I lay out three important principles. Um, obviously due process, freedom of speech, academic freedom. Also, I talk about meritocracy and the need to have equality, not based on race. You know, my bar mitzvah sedra was shoftim. My mother used to always say it was bashert, that uh, I would be bar mitzvah in the portion of the week which deals with justice, tzedek, tzedek, terdo. Justice, justice must you seek. I used to think that was the most important provision. And then just recently, when I had my 71st anniversary of my bar mitzvah, I read from Shoftim for my family. And I noticed a line in it that I hadn't really focused on before. When instructing judges what to do, it obviously says you can't take bribes because bribes blind the eyes even of the most righteous people. But then before that, even before that, it says, lo takir panim, do not recognize faces. If there's any single importance, important element of justice, it's low takir ponem. Don't recognize faces. That's why the Statue of Justice has blindfolds. But today, everybody's peeking between the blindfolds. Today, justice doesn't depend on right or wrong or the evidence. Uh, justice depends on who you are, what's your race, what's your gender, what's your name, uh, what side are you on politically, Oh, what's your party? Uh, and and uh, you can't have justice when the first thing you recognize is faces, races, places, and other kinds of things that should be irrelevant to, to justice. So I'm going to be a lone person for many years, I know. Um, conservatives, many conservatives today, support my points of view on justice, on free speech. There are not very many liberals, and I'm not leaving liberalism. I am still a liberal. I'm not going to be pushed out of my 60-year stance for liberalism by extremists on the hard left. But it's very hard today to find a liberal, a liberal Democrat, who supports these points of due process, etc. And uh, that's what's made me a lonely person. Um, I can't become a Republican because even though I support their views on Israel and I support their views on foreign policy, I don't support their views on abortion, gay rights, gun control, environment, 
and a range of other issues, separation of church and state. But I can't remain in a party that doesn't marginalize the squad and extremists. Um, I am a Biden Democrat, um, and uh, I, I am comfortable with Biden as president, but I think it was uh, Tom Friedman in the New York Times who said Biden may be the last pro-Israel president the Democrats ever nominate. And of course, Biden isn't perfect. He's far from perfect. He's a lot better than Obama, but he's far from perfect. But what do you do? There are many people my age, many people of my political persuasion, who used to be very supportive of the Democrats, very supportive of liberal values, who really can't any longer support that side, but they can't join the Republicans. And I wrote another book about that called The Case for Liberalism in an Age of Extremism, or Why I Left the Left But Couldn't Join the Right. So, um, you know, I write about every subject I care about. Um, every morning I wake up and I say, what upsets me? And so I do three things. I, I'm on a program called uh, Locals, where every day I do a two minute spiel on what I, what I think about that day. I have a podcast called The Der Show. So I talk about my views on that for a half an hour. And then I write my books and my op-eds. And uh, that's the best I can do. And uh, so I'm going to hope to continue to write books. I hope you'll continue to read my books along with others. Um, mm -hmm. Books, of course, are becoming anachronistic. I love a cartoon that appeared, oh, it must have been 15 years ago, and, or maybe 20 years ago when the internet was first starting in Kindle and all that. And it shows an old man uh, in a shop in 1400 and whatever, 20, and he's, he's writing on scrolls, on parchment, on scrolls. He sells scrolls. And his young son walks in carrying a book. And the father says, oh, this is the end of the world. No more scrolls, we now have books. And after scrolls and after books, we have the internet. Uh, like anything, books, who, what were the first books that were published? I have hanging on my wall one of the first things published after Gutenberg invented the movable printing press, one of the first things from Nuremberg, 1490, a blood libel against the Jews. So books were used for good and for bad. Um, they produced Newton and they produced Holocaust uh, supporters. Uh, the internet is good and it's bad. Um, every means of communication, is good and bad. And what we have to do is get in front of it and make sure that we use the intellect, the energy that has made the Jewish people so successful in so many parts of the world uh, to defend Israel and to make Israel the highest priority in our human rights work and our civil liberties work. And that's what I intend to do for as long as the good Lord gives me the power and the energy to and the writing ability to continue to do that. So I'd love to have some questions uh, uh, from you about my writing, uh, about how I write, about uh, any of the substantive issues we've talked about. And I, I hope we'll read my book. Great. Um, Cloney, some quick question about the writing. About how many hours a day do you spend at this? Um, and, al and also, uh, you said that you don't do that. Every day. Is I'm sorry? No. I, uh, what I do is I write everything by hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's me, um, a, a pen, and a yellow pad or a white pad. And then I Xerox my handwritten stuff to my assistant in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She types the first draft. I then redo the first draft, send her another version, and that's it, basically. And then mm -hmm. the book comes back in galleys, and I make last-minute revisions in my galleys. Um, my editors obviously um, uh, have input. Um, my wife. Okay. So when uh, when Ruth Ginsburg died on Rosh Hashanah a few years ago, um, and the uh, uh, President Trump had to fill the seat, the publisher asked me to write a book called "Affirming Justice or Injustice," and um, he asked me to do it like on October first. And by so uh, as I said, I. I, I wrote a book and it was published within one month. Um, and uh, I love my new publisher. Um, it's called um, uh, Hot Books. And, um, and, and they managed to 
produce the book within a month after you get it to them. And so uh, you can be very current and very top. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, and I, I'm gonna turn it, I know Steve Fellman had a question. Um, he texted me, uh, he uh, messaged me and please, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand or, or put your question in the chat for me to read or, or ask or to ask yourself. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask about was the, um, you wrote you wrote about uh, Massachusetts Discrimination Board, which uh, found uh, against a, an attorney uh, who represented female uh, divorce uh, clients and refused to uh, to represent a a male divorce client, and they found that she was discriminating. Uh, but you know, and I, I was just also thinking about the whole Skokie issue, and that's something that's bothered me for a while. When I was in law school at University of Chicago, uh, the whole Skokie um, matter was was happening, and the ACLU attorney who was representing the Nazis and the uh, uh, the Jew both Jewish and the Jewish attorney who was representing uh, the town of Skokie uh, both came to the school and gave presentations about it. And I remember thinking at the time. Uh, you know, that I personally could not imagine myself ever representing Nazis. I mean, I wouldn't condemn people who who, who represented them, like the people who condemned <laughs> you for representing Trump and the people who, you know, who, who basically forced law firms to to withdraw from representing him, which I thought is horrendous, um, or, you know, for, to do that for anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just personally couldn't see ever being able to stomach doing that or to stomach, for instance, uh, representing uh, the Sparrow bomber or, or the guy who just killed uh, uh, an Israeli, the, the member of the Palestinian police who just killed an Israeli this past week, or Mahmoud Abbas and his whole team who pay terrorists to murder Jews. I just, I just, I just couldn't manage that, and uh, personally, and and I mean. I mean, so so I'm not I'm not clear if you think that it's a, an obligation of every attorney to represent um, people who are so despicable, or, or are you just saying that when you represent somebody like that, you know, people should just understand that you know, you're doing a job that uh, no, needs I to think be it's an obligation of every attorney to do it because if you don't do it, why should anybody else do it? Uh, if you don't represent people who are despise, um, then others won't defend, defend people who are despised. And every criminal should be despised. I hate most of my uh, criminal defendant clients. Uh, if I allowed my personal views to uh, affect who I represented, I would end up defending, you know, Natan Sharansky and six other people in my 50-year career, 60-year career. Uh, so, no, I think it's, it's wrong to... Uh, um, allow personal views. Now, I didn't defend the Nazis in Skokie, just like I didn't defend yeah. uh, you know, what, what O.J. Simpson, I defended Palestinian students who wanted to put up the Palestinian flag to commemorate the death of Yasser Arafat. And I said to them, I would defend their right to put up the flag, but I would speak at the event and talk about how horrible Yasser Arafat was. And, and I, I did that. And so, um, you know, it, once you start saying that it is a principle that you should defend only people you agree with. Yeah, but there's, there's also the issue of zealous representation. If you're personally so turned off by somebody, how can you possibly give them, uh, or, or for some people, you know, maybe some people can, but maybe some other attorneys feel that they cannot zealously represent somebody who they're so appalled by. You know, so, so what about a doctor in the emergency room? Palestinian terrorist comes in. Um, should a doctor refuse to uh, take care of that person? Uh, should a rabbi refuse to uh, minister to a Madoff? Um, should a priest refuse to administer to somebody who's done something uh, pretty despicable? Um, we have, you know, this is not Nazi Germany. So we're not talking about people being guards at Auschwitz. We're talking about a fair, important system of justice. And it's essential to that important system of justice that lo takir ponim should apply to lawyer the implications of having lawyers recognizing faces, takir ponim, or recognizing acts. 
I think the system of justice as advocated in Shoftim and as advocated by our due process in the Constitution requires that all people be represented. And if you believe that all people should be represented, um, you have to just be willing to do it, even if it's difficult. Now, if it's somebody who's attacked their own family, of course not, if you have a conflict of interest. But if it's uh, somebody who's been accused of a heinous crime, uh, your job is to represent them. Mostly if my clients are guilty and th their guilt is obvious, I'll arrange a plea bargain. Uh, I don't like to lose and I don't like to lose for my clients. And I don't lose that often because um, I, I give advice to my clients uh, and the advice is often to plead guilty and make a good deal or the best possible deal. But uh, if, if a trial is what's necessary, I'll, I'll do that trial. Let's remember that in some parts of the world, representing a Zionist would be equivalent in the minds of these perverts to representing Nazis. And so uh, when I represented Jews in the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet authorities were appalled that I would represent somebody as terrible as Natan Sharansky. So what's terrible in the eyes of some are not terrible in the eyes of others and vice versa. So I'm going to continue to represent people you don't like. Okay. Um, uh, Steve Feldman, you have a question? Thank you, Liz. Thanks for calling on me. Professor Dershowitz, thank you for recognizing the unparalleled work that ZOA does and, and for your support of our organization. You uh, made some important, many important points, including the fact that things are worse today than they were under McCarthyism. That's right. uh, as concisely as possible, can you describe how we got to this point? What can we learn from how we got here to reverse it? It's, it is a great question. Um, um, look, it all starts with the Reverend Berrigan, who will go down in history as one of the most significant anti-Semites in the history of America. And he's adored by so many people. Uh, Reverend Berrigan single-handedly turned the left uh, away from Israel um, and got other people like the Kunstler and like Chomsky. But that change occurred. And I pointed it out and I wrote books about it. And then it got caught on by Jimmy Carter and by others and, uh, and anti-Israel attitudes um, are usually the canary in the, in the mine because with this, with it, when you're anti-Zionist and anti-Israel, you eventually are anti-free speech, anti-civil liberties, anti-American. And um, so I think it's a process that the left has moved away from tolerance and from civil liberties and from liberal principles. I use liberal in the classical sense of um, uh, free speech and, and due process, et cetera. So um, I do think that it's gonna be very hard to move away. Um, I think we have to continue to fight the fight and not give up. Um, I've been extraordinarily disappointed by the Jewish community. Uh, and the leadership of the Jewish community. Um, I did uh, a great deal on behalf of Jewish values and they totally abandoned me as soon as I was canceled and became part of the cancel culture. And, um, and uh, we have to do is fight in their own community. And there has been of, of that fighting back. The rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, when he read my book, The Price of Principle, said he was going to use it as part of the Yom Kippur speech. He read a, pre a preview of it. And he said, it's such an important point. And then he, then he canceled me. Um, he didn't want to cancel me. It was the board of directors, the chairman of the board of directors, who was an advertising guy who advertised a pharmacology and very, very, very bad products, probably caused more deaths um, uh, than, than, than many other people. He's the chairman of the board. He's rich. So he's the chairman of the board of uh, Temple Emanuel, and he was the one who insisted that I be canceled. So, but one more okay. question, okay? Okay, let's see. Um, okay, Martin Zukoff, do you want to ask ask your question? Are you there, or should should I read it for you? Okay, Martin Z Marty Zukoff asks, do you believe that major Jewish organizations have failed the American Jewish community, and what can be done to save the American Jewish community? 
Well, the American Jewish community is in trouble. Uh, it's in trouble from the American Jewish community. Do uh, you remember the old Pogo strip uh, in which Pogo looks around and says, we have seen the enemy and they are us. Uh, the enemies are primarily Jews. Um, um, Jews are doing more harm to the Jewish community than non-Jews. It used to be that we were victims of external forces, of anti-Semitism. Uh, we still have a lot of that. I would say the major, major uh, enemies of current Jewish values are Jewish leaders. Um, and uh, we have to fight that fight. One of the reasons I'm such a strong supporter of ZOA is that Mort has been very one of the few people who've had the courage to stand up to the Jewish establishment. The Jewish establishment is wealthy and well-connected, and they don't want to shake the boat. Um, that was true Today, it was true in 1939, it was true in 1942, when Felix Frankfurter refused to go to Franklin Roosevelt and tell him about the Holocaust. There's a new play opening uh, in, in New York about the life of Jan Karski, one of my great heroes. Jan Karski was a Polish Catholic lawyer who went into the death camps and uh, came to America and tried to reach Franklin Roosevelt and Felix Frankfurter stopped him from reaching Franklin Roosevelt because he didn't want to endanger his position as Roosevelt's friend. And, you know, so many other Jewish leaders from so many Jewish organizations refused to do anything about the Holocaust. Uh, the Sulzbergers, the New York Times, refused to report on it. And so I think our first step is to fight within the Jewish organizations and to um, make them accountable to their people. They're not accountable to the majority of Jews in America today. And I think the ZOA is a very important uh, organization for keeping the Jewish community honest and making sure that they're not self-serving just to keep themselves as part of the establishment, but rather who are willing to take risks and show courage and live by principles. Principle is not a word that I would use today to describe many of the leaders of the Jewish community. I thank you very much. I hope next time we do this, we can do better technology. But um, uh, Shana Tova to everybody, and may next year be a better year for Israel, for Kalal Yisrael, for ZOA, and for uh, important points of principle. Thank you so much. And, and, for, Take you and, care. Your, and for you and your family, uh, Alan. And if everybody uh, wants to stay on for a minute, uh, we're going to just give you a couple of have a couple of announcements. And I'll, oh, Alan, Jay. Yep, I'm here. Uh, first of all, thank you to our wonderful guest. Uh, one of my announcers is going to be to tell you that we're celebrating our 125th year at our upcoming ZOA Gala, Superstar Gala, which is going to take place on November 13th. You should all have received our Save the Date. More details will follow, but just to let you know, we're going to be honoring uh, the Honorable Representative Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader. We're, rep we're honoring Ambassador Jason Greenblatt, one of the authors of the Abraham Accords. Uh, our guest, Alan Dershowitz, will be one of our yeah. will be one of our presenters, uh, and there's a host of other people that we'll be honoring. We hope you can be there. It's November 13th and Sunday early in the evening. Times will be uh, disseminated in a in an email that was sent out soon. We hope you can be there. I did put a link in the uh, chat. If you can, please support our work. And Liz, I'll turn it over to you to close. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here. Well, and I apologize about all the problems that we had with, with te technical difficulties today. Um, usually, as you know, it doesn't happen like that, but uh, we, we don't know what, what happened today. And uh, thank you again and wishing everybody Shana Tuva. Hope to hear you soon. See everybody again soon. Hear from you. Feel free to get in touch. Um, if you have questions beforehand on any of our speakers, feel free to get in touch with, touch with us or afterwards. And uh, also, you know, we have a number of other speakers that we're planning. We don't have dates yet uh, lined up for them, but we'll uh, be letting you know. Watch out for our announcements. And I look forward to seeing everybody soon and wishing everybody, wish everybody Shana Tova. Thank you.